I'm sure that when you hear the words bah humbug, your mind immediately goes to something you haven't read for years. Charles Dickens Christmas Carol and that fictional anti-hero named Ebenezer Scrooge. Remember him? The original Grinch that tried to steal Christmas, that's Ebenezer Scrooge. The picture of a cynical man, that's all that was in his life and in his, his whole manner of thinking was cynicism. When you think about Ebenezer Scrooge, you think about somebody that's mean and stingy, insensitive and selfish, unkind. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in that that we miss the main point. Scrooge was profane in his attitude, summed up in those two words concerning Christmas. He said, bah, humbug. You see, he demeaned that which was holy. He trampled on the sanctity of Christmas. He despised the sacred. He was cynical toward that which is sublime. You see, Christmas is a holiday in the best sense of the word. It is a holiday, the world's most joyous holiday. It is truly a holy day. Businesses close. Families gather together. Churches are full. Pastors get excited and think something good is going on. Maybe this will stick. And then comes the Sunday after Christmas and... It thins out again. It's been known to happen that during wartime, soldiers have laid down their weapons on Christmas Day and never picked them up. It's an interesting, interesting time. It's a day that differs from all others. And yet I've found this, there's still plenty of Scrooges in the world. There's even some hanging around the church. I don't know if you've ever noticed them or not. You know, you, you find them, they, they've got complaints about commercialism. You, you, you find another batch, they're saying, put Christ back into Christmas. Then you got some folks that they're worried about the tradition of Santa Claus, that it's sacrilege. And then there's some that say the church invented Christmas to compete with other religious festivities, just a capitulation to paganism. And so we easily find people willing to reign on Jesus' parade. They attempt to detach themselves from all that's going on and literally become Scrooge in the midst of the most exciting time of the year. And yeah, it, it's a time of commerce. I don't know where you were Friday morning and I don't know what possessed us. <laughs> but at, at, at about 10 o'clock Friday morning, we were out in this mess called Fresno. And we, we, there was an item that we'd been looking at to get for a thing we do for our kids. And we found that we could buy it at this place 40 bucks cheaper than we'd seen anywhere else. And in this year of Discover the Joy, it's kind of important, you know, that you save 40 bucks where you can. And we walked into this place and looked around and said, whoa. And I said, hey, it's a day off, kid. We'll find what we want. I'll stand in line. You go wander around the store and do some more shopping. I didn't know how long the line was at that point. <laughs> it was like Disneyland for a major ride. I mean, around and around and around. And clear over by the televisions, that was the end of the line. And that's where I got into line. I'd, I'd love to have some kind of a little 
computer that would tell me how much stuff they sold off the shelves that they routed you past. You know, easy items to pick off the shelf. Well, get one of these. You stand there and look at it long enough, suddenly it looks good to you, you know, something, <laughs> something you can't live without. And then I found out I hadn't read the paper good enough to understand that the great sales were happening between 8 and noon on Friday. And here we are at 10 o'clock in the middle of all of this. A lot of commercialism. You bet. Great Christmas ads, great decorations, a lot of good things happening. Remember this about the commerce. It's driven by one primary motive, the buying of gifts for others. Hey, is that vile? Is that bad? Is that terrible? I don't think so. You know, I walked in this morning and I found a neatly wrapped package on my desk with a little card on top of it. I thought, well, this is probably something for Christmas. I'll take it home and put it under the tree when we put it, uh uh. I opened the card and read the card and tore the wrapping off that beautiful gift from a couple in this church. Something I will wear with great delight. There's enough kid in you if you let him out that you can enjoy receiving a gift. You see, that, that whole thing rests ultimately on the supreme gift of God to us. When you read John 3, 16, listen to this verse. See, John 3, I know, we go, listen. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. Isn't that interesting? So that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This whole idea of giving came from God. When you read in Romans chapter five, when we were utterly helpless with no way of escape, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners who had no use for him. Even if we were good, we really wouldn't expect anyone to die for us, though of course that might be barely possible. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. That is a gift, my friend. Like that scripture reading in John 4 that you're supposed to read, 1 John chapter 4. God sent his only son into this wicked world. God knew how wicked we were and still he sent his son so that he could die in our place and we would have the privilege to put our faith in him. In Romans chapter 8, it says, since God did not even spare his own son for us but gave him up for us all, won't he surely give us everything else? God is a giving God. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, Christ suffered. He died once for the sins of all us guilty sinners, although he himself was innocent of any sin at any time. Why? That he might bring us safely home to God. I love to listen to Steve Brown. He speaks on the radio and I get his tapes from some studies he does. He has a marvelous voice, kind of one of the great voices in radio. And one of the things Steve Brown keeps talking about is helping us get safely home to God the Father. That's what we're in business for here, is to help people get safely home. And I always believe when I look at a crowd this size, there are some that have gathered that have not yet come to the Lord Jesus Christ and put their faith and their trust in him as their savior. They've not yet acknowledged their need. And you may be one of those, and this may be the right day for you to pull a card on that rack and fill it out, put it in one of these boxes, and let one of us sit with you this week and open the scriptures to show you how you can come to know God personally through his son, Jesus Christ. Because that's my question. Have you received this gift from God? Or are you still spurning the gift? 
Are you still saying, I'll, I'll investigate, I'll open that later? Time to pay attention to the gift and receive that gift. For there's no other gift that will give you access to God the Father in a loving, caring atmosphere except receiving his son, Jesus Christ. When I think about the Scrooges who say, well, what about putting Christ back into Christmas? It's not necessary. He never left. Listen to the name, Christmas, okay? You understand that? Unless you get into that Xmas deal. I was driving down the street Friday, went past a church in this town. Good church. They preach the word. They believe the word. But somebody must have been in charge of making the signs that was not a good sign person. Okay? You, we've all had those jobs where somebody said, you do this. And you, and, you know, you did it and it was poor. Drive by and it says, Xmas Boutique. I said to Roberta, whoa. He slipped up a little over there. When the church is saying Xmas, unknown quantity, huh? Remember when you were taking algebra and all that business? I, it took me, I never took it. But I, I, I just think about all of that and, and, and think about the, how easily we slip off into that. But I'm gonna tell you something. Christ never left Christmas. Jingle bells will never replace Silent Night. You just watch. You can watch crusty people. Silent night begins to play and something tweaks at those people and they're back. They're a kid 10 years old back somewhere on a farm in Nebraska somewhere and remembering all of that stuff and they just, they just can't handle it because it makes them feel too human and too vulnerable. That's going to be with us, folks. Christ is in Christmas. Now, Thanksgiving, that's another story. You know, Thanksgiving may just be Turkey Day. I was kidding Mitch in the early service because Jamie and I did a wedding yesterday together. She was telling me, boy, Mitch just had a football feast. And he admitted it was wonderful. Now, he took time to praise the Lord and thank the Lord and do Psalm 100 and all of that. But Thanksgiving kind of gets swallowed up now in Christmas. But I'll tell you, there's no danger of Christmas ever being called, well, we're going to have gift day. We're going to have Christmas day. And the world is reminded that Jesus was born. Hold that thought. The world is reminded that Jesus was born. And then some Christian Scrooge says, what about Santa Claus? What about him? You know, any kid over five understands Santa Claus is a myth. And if you haven't figured that out yet, come to my office. I'll be glad to explain it all to you. All right? See, myths are good in our culture. It's only when those myths are sold as being real that it becomes fraud. I'll tell, I'll tell you when some of you folks that are so set against Santa Claus will suddenly change it when that three-year-old granddaughter of yours climbs up in Santa Claus's lap somewhere and they take a picture and then want to sell you one or two and you want to buy a dozen because you got places you want to put them everywhere. Suddenly the perspective changes. And I think about those who say, what about the historical origins of Christmas as a substitute for pagan festivals? Well, I want to tell you something that you know, I'd bet money that 98% of you don't even know. There was a religion called Mithraism. M-I-T-H-R-A-I-S-M. -I -I Flourished in the Roman Empire in the first and second and third century. A lot of pagan stuff going on. But I'm going to tell you what happened. The early Christians, in their zeal to talk about this living Christ who had been born in Bethlehem, and they shared the story, and they celebrated his birth to such an extent that you've never even heard of Mithraism. 
It's gone. And Christianity has circled the globe with people that are loving and trusting Jesus just as we are. And a great part of that is taking time to celebrate this glorious event. I feel this, folks. We must celebrate this glorious event because we know the difference between that which is sacred and that which is profane. Profane. To make common. That's what profanity is all about. When we take the name of God himself and make it common and drag it through the mud. We know the difference between that which is sacred and that which is profane. Just a couple of illustrations. When God appeared to Moses, Moses out there in the backside of the desert herding his sheep. He's tending his flock one day and he saw a bush on fire, but the bush wasn't burning up. And being a curious fellow and having very little to do on the backside of the desert, he went over to the bush to investigate and God called out to him and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, who is it? And God said, don't come any closer. Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses covered his face with his hands, for he was afraid to look at God. Take off your shoes. That's holy ground. What made it holy? When God appeared to Moses in that place, that which was common became uncommon. When you find Jacob over in the 28th chapter of Genesis, he's heading off back to where his people came from to find a wife. And that night when he stopped at camp at sundown, he found a rock for a headrest. I always like to believe he wrapped his coat around that rock and laid down to sleep and he dreamed that a staircase reached from earth to heaven and he saw the angels of God going up and down upon it and at the top of the stairs stood the Lord and the Lord said, I am Jehovah, the God of Abraham and of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on is yours. I will give it to you and to your descendants for you will have descendants as many as dust they will cover the land from east to west and from north to south. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I'm with you and will protect you wherever you go and will bring you back safely to this land. I will be with you constantly until I finish giving you all I'm promising. And then Jacob woke up. And he exclaimed in terror, God lives here. I've stumbled into his home. This is the awesome entrance to heaven. And the next morning he got up very early and set his stone headrest upright as a memorial pillar and poured olive oil over it. What was the difference? He said, God has touched this place. When he appears at a place, that place is holy. When he appears in time, that time is holy. And I remind you that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And if you ever have the privilege to go there, the commercialism may cause you to say, what's this all about? But there's still something inside of you that will say the eternal word of God became flesh in this setting. God came down to man. Emmanuel, God is with us. And it's something to rejoice about and something to be excited about. And I challenge you, just two things. If you've not yet trusted Jesus as your Savior, it's time, my friend. It's time. And if you're a born-again believer, don't be a Scrooge. Enjoy the season. Share with others your faith. Share the joy and delight that there is. And find yourself causing others to say, what is the great joy in the midst of all of the panic in the streets? What is the great joy? The joy is in our heart because we've met the Savior. And he's the one whose message we need to share. Stand with me. Let's pray.
Oh, Father, I pray that as we read 1 John chapter 4 this week, that we, we would be reminded of that incredible gift that you sent to us in the person of your Son. And he willingly came for us. He did that unspeakable thing. Took our sins upon his back. Paved the way for us to have a relationship with you, dear Father. How could we ever thank you enough? Help us not to be pulling our righteous robes around us and trying to set ourselves apart from everyone. Help us to be in the middle of the pack acknowledging Jesus Christ and his birth and who he is and why he came and what he did and the fact that he is coming back someday. I pray for those who are worshiping this morning that are still on a search to find their way to the Savior. Oh, I pray that this would be the day they'd pull out a card and fill it out and put it in a box and let us sit with them and share the good news that God is truly with us in his son, Jesus Christ. Grant us your peace and your joy, dear Father. May this be the most incredible season we've ever known. Give us that active courage that it takes to stand, even if we must stand alone, to acknowledge the true identity of your son. Bless us as we go from here. We we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you.